Thank you for your kind introduction and thank you all for, for staying. I am the very last speaker today, so I have to be, I have to be engaging and I'm going to be engaging by radicalizing uh, the differences that you might not have observed between Marek's perspective and Andrew's uh, perspective. You see, Andrew started his... You saved me the trouble. Uh, that's right. <laughs> Andrew started by reclaiming his Central European heritage, talking about Imre Nod, uh, talking about your Slovak uh, heritage, but he is far too American, of course, in his optimism. Uh, Marek Cichotsky, Central European, focusing on problems that Europe is experiencing, and I want to endorse both perspectives, but then I'll end up uh, siding with uh, Marek. I want to thank the organizers for inviting me. <laughs> I, I, I uh, was invited kind of Enjoy late in time, so I have not circulated the paper, but the debates really motivated me to, to write up a proper uh, paper, so I want to thank Tomas and, and uh, Michal. But I also want to thank Professor Brigitte Lafan, who is hiding in the corner there, and uh, Brigitte's passion for Central and Eastern Europe, I understand was even instrumental for the organization of this conference. It might have uh, given me competitive advantage when I got my first tenure track job in Dublin, <coughs> at the University College Dublin, where we worked together. Uh, but it also enabled me to invite uh, Professor Geremek uh, to Dublin in 2005, uh, and I fondly remember that. So Barroso boasted about having met Geremek. I thought I should do the same. And you mentioned Imre Nagy. You see, you mentioned Imre Nagy as the great revolutionary leader. A Central European would also remember that he was murdered by the Soviet rulers in 1958. And what I want to look at is both. You know, the soft power Europe or the power of nonviolent politics that I associate with 1989, but also the limits of that power. So that's the dual perspective. I, I have, and if you want, I could go back to 1956, because even that revolution started as a nonviolent revolution. For a couple of weeks, it looked like Hungary would free itself from Soviet uh, domination, right? But it was not to be because uh, the uh, revolt was suppressed by military means, and as I said, uh, Imre Nagy uh, was murdered in 1958, right? So I want to look at that uh, dual uh, uh, legacy, and, and there is no better time to do so. Uh, than now, right? Because Ukraine also embodies this, this double legacy of uh, 1989. So what I want to look at is the legacy of 1989 in positive and, and less positive way, if you want, and how it affects the relationship between the EU and Russia, the EU and Ukraine. For me, this is one of the most powerful images from Maidan, right? Uh, I used it in my lecture in Hong Kong, and I asked students, what does that EU flag mean there, right? Is Ukraine going to become a member of the European Union tomorrow? Of course not, right? So it's a very powerful symbolic statement in the midst of that, that violent uh, chaos to which the Ukrainian second Orange Revolution, if you want, descended. And of course the timing is incredibly uh, uh, good in that we just had elections in in uh, Europe, well, two kind of elections, right? The one uh, for the European Parliament and the one in Ukraine. And as Timothy Snyder commented, uh, a great historian of uh, Ukraine, Russia, and, and Poland, if West Europeans voted the way Ukrainians did, Europe would have a much uh, brighter future ahead of itself, right? Uh, because uh, despite Putin's propaganda that claimed that Ukrainians are, you know, driven by mad fascists, uh, the, the neo-Nazi candidates in Ukrainian elections totaled uh, less than 2%. There were two candidates. Uh, a Jewish candidate, in fact, uh, gained more uh, votes uh, than that. While we all know that Marine Le Pen uh, attracted uh, uh, most votes in, in, in France. Uh, so in some ways, Ukraine is more European today than, than uh, many countries in uh, Western Europe. But I want to talk about the legacy of 1989. And... Uh, we mentioned Geremek, we mentioned Imre Nagy. The other person that the conference is dedicated to is Václav Havel. Uh, and uh, Václav Havel was even a theorist of nonviolent revolution, as was Geremek, right? So for me, 1989 is hugely significant in that it redefined the very meaning of uh, revolution, right? It, it, uh, it changed the very meaning of revolution in that it uh, focused on nonviolent uh, means, right? And uh, that event then inspired a series of colored revolutions which sought to radically transform societies by 
strikingly moderate means. So people like Václav Havel, Bronislav Geremek, Adam Michnik were non-revolutionary revolutionaries, right? And they were proudly uh, non-revolutionary revolutionaries. They rejected the Jacobin heritage of 1789. Again, I always tell my students, this is quite uh, remarkable. Exactly 200 years after the French Revolution, the very meaning of revolution is changed through 1989, so much so that 1989 arguably becomes a model of kind of nonviolent revolutionary uh, transformation. Whether these <coughs> events were successful or not, they, they were for real. In fact, I didn't include Slovakia there, uh, but uh, uh, our former minister Kukan might uh, uh, side with me when I say that in 1998 in Slovakia we had the second velvet uh, revolution that uh, uh, served as a model to Serbian demonstrators in Georgia 2003, and of course everyone knows about the Ukrainian Orange Revolution, which was the high point of that kind of non-revolutionary revolutions, uh, you know. So in appearance, these events often resembled rock concerts or carnivals in their aims. They were about democratization, the rule of law, rather than some radically new ideological projects. But however appealing these methods were, they had their limitations. And one of them was that if the rulers resorted to violence, then you were stuffed, right? However, you were committed to nonviolent methods. So whether we include the Arab uh, revolutions, you know, into that category is very questionable, of course, because they were not uh, nonviolent. And even, of course, uh, the more recent revolution in Ukraine was not free of violence, and, and uh, there is going to be more of it uh, as we speak. And that reminds me of the double legacy of 1989. And there is no better place to be reminded of it than Hong Kong or the University of Hong Kong because we have a monument on the campus commemorating the massacre that will be now commemorated like a uh, quarter of a century, right? Uh, the Tiananmen Square massacre. So on the very same day when Europe really uh, made a decisive step towards the demise of communism with the uh, first semi-free elections in uh, Poland, the Chinese communist rulers showed that if you are determined to hold on to power and are willing to resort to violence, then soft power will not defeat you, right? And I think that is a very real problem that Europe faces uh, uh, today. Now, 1989, of course, how, how the EU relates to all uh, of this? To start with, we can simply say that the EU loves nonviolent revolutions. It sees its own beauty reflected in them because it defines itself as a nonviolent power, right? So Western intellectuals were very quick to assimilate these events into the narrative of West European integration. Jürgen Habermas talk about catching up uh, revolutions, you know, Ulrich Beck, uh, Anthony Giddens, they all came up with their own story that integrated uh, the uh, process of uh, anti-communist revolutions into, into the uh, project of West European integration. In fact, 1989 also reminded West Europeans of the key values which underpinned the project of European integration, democracy and liberty under the rule of law because uh, for the first time West Europeans were forced to think about what the project was all about, right? The Copenhagen criteria, you can argue, is the institutionalist uh, expression of those uh, values. Yeah, for the first time, the EU defined its own uh, uh, agenda. The Treaty of Rome envisaged that any European state could become a member. Of course, it was, uh, it was implied that that member would be a liberal democracy, but it was only after 1989 that it was truly spelled out, and, and the entire literature on European identity, of course, uh, uh, massively uh, expanded uh, exactly in, in that uh, decade. And there are echoes in, in, uh, of, of that celebration of nonviolent power in accounts that we got both from Milada Vahudova and uh, Andrew Moravchik. Uh, so Andrew celebrated the quiet superpower four years ago and again in, in the current paper along similar lines. And as I said, I side with it. Because when you look at the policy of enlargement, when you look at the countries of Central Europe, it has been remarkably uh, successful, yeah? Their soft power worked. What is soft power? I have a definition that uh, my students like, so I'll try it here. It's not very sophisticated. Soft power is when I make you want what I want you to want without you even noticing. But for this power to work, right, you need to want it a bit from the outset. 
That's the way it works. And that's the way it worked in, in Central Europe because the slogan of these 89 revolutions was a return uh, to Europe. So they wanted to be uh, uh, influenced by the European Union. They wanted to return uh, to Europe as one of the main slogans of that revolution had it. So as I said, I agree. The EU's most effective foreign policy tool was the enlargement. I agree, it's still being used in the Balkans. So undoubtedly, when a country desires membership and the EU has a credible strategy to offer it, its power is substantial. The problem occurs when full membership is not on the table either because the country does not desire it, and Russia is an obvious example, even though in the 90s it played with the idea of being a member of the EU, or its prospect raises difficulties that the existing members do not want to contemplate. And Ukraine is the obvious example of that scenario, right? For these countries, the EU came up with a strategy of neighborhood policy, which is now in shambles. And that is where I see the limits of soft power Europe, and those limits are hugely significant, right? So that's why I'm not American enough to side with Andrew Moravchik's optimism. <coughs> It's all well to focus on where Europe worked, but what worries me is where it failed to work, the neighborhood policy and the rise of new imperialist Russia, right? So I see, yes, strong EU, soft power Europe when it comes to enlargement, but weak EU when it comes to neighborhood policy, and it defies my imagination. I was on a panel with diplomats in Hong Kong who were trying to convince our Chinese students there that there's nothing wrong with the neighborhood policy and that's all working very well as it's meant to. I thought, are you kidding me or yourself or the whole of Europe? Uh, there was a distinguished panelist there who is the uh, Consul General of Germany, the son of Otto Graf Lambsdorff, yeah, a prominent diplomat telling, saying exactly that. So I see that we do have a problem with the rising imperialist uh, Russia. And now, about Russia and the influence of 1989. I have a friend in Melbourne, Robert Horvath, who published a book last year about Putin's preventive counter-revolution, where he traces the influence of 1989, first looking at these colored revolutions, familiar story, right? But 1989, or more specifically, the Orange Revolution in Ukraine, which failed, as we all know, had also an unlikely follower. And that follower is Vladimir Putin. So in response to the threat of democratic ideals infecting Russia, Vladimir Putin and his ideologues engineered a veritable velvet counter-revolution, right? Velvet counter-revolution, the specter of a Moscow Maidan was to be kept at bay by state-sponsored public mobilization, which gave rise to a nationalist project with distinctly imperial dimensions. And Putin adapted a two-fold strategy. One is familiar, crackdown on opposition, etc. right? But the other one is quite novel, and it's really directly inspired by Maidan. You know, that is... The public space was crowded out by fake spontaneity engineered by political technologists surrounding Putin. The most famous and consequential is perhaps the Nashi movement, Nashi in Russian meaning just ours, uh, which prides itself on having staged an alternative Moscow Maidan preempting the colored revolution in Russia. You can see some images of that. To be honest, I, I mean, like I only started researching it uh, quite recently and any comparison is far-fetching, but I couldn't think, uh, I couldn't help but think about Hitler Youth, right? And a few critics of that movement uh, uh, made that comparison because the aim really is to influence the youth of Russia for this imperialist project of Euro-Asian integration. So this greatly solidified Putin's regime, which he dubbed a sovereign democracy, a nationalist project reinforcing national borders against Western soft power and nurturing the patriotic sensibility of a new generation of youth. Now, I take some pride in this, in this volume because I told Robert to write something like this. <laughs> I, I, I reflected on the, on the uh, meaning of this uh, uh, public mobilization. 
But when he wrote it, I thought he massively exaggerated the threat emanating from uh, Russia. And yet he's been vindicated. So were the Poles or Estonians who've been saying in the 1990s that you cannot trust Russia as a reliable partner. Now, Andrew Moravchik, even in the current paper, refers to Russia in passing as, you know, uh, uh, all these great powers which embarked in the direction of democracy, economic development, and cooperative international relations. Great liberal idea, but is it working? You know, most great powers, Moravchik writes, even China, Russia, and Turkey, for all their problems, have made enormous strides in this direction since the end of the Cold War. Have they? I don't know about Russia. I read Russian, and what I read is not very encouraging, right? And I live in China, and what I observe is not very encouraging. Excuse uh, me, but you were the one four hours ago castigating all of us for making comparisons to communist regimes like this, and now you're telling me it's all the same. No, no, no. I, I, the point I made, <laughs> the point I made earlier on was against the positive legacies of communism, which I still think is morally questionable. To, to, to interrogate the positive legacies of, of communism and, and the counter proposition I want, I, that the provocation was why don't we talk about positive legacies of Nazism? We don't talk about positive legacies of Nazism because that would be in bad moral taste. It doesn't make sense. And it equally doesn't make sense to talk about positive legacies of communism. They were, uh, these societies maintained some values despite communism, not thanks to communism, and they maintain education system that even endowed me with some basic humanist education, but despite uh, communism, not thanks uh, to communism. That, that was the point. Uh, but now I lost about two minutes of my brilliant presentation. We add on these two minutes. Okay, okay. But if you seek, do you think you need five minutes or so? Yes, yes, five minutes. So this is Nashi and Putin, uh, you know, being celebrated and celebrating the youth of Russia. Now the Provocative proposition I want to make that goes beyond Robert Horvath's book is that the imperialist project on which Putin embarked amounts to a logical extension of that preemptive velvet counter-revolution. Because what we are witnessing is a new kind of war, and I say a velvet occupation, velvet firmly in inverted commas, because it was not very velvet, but Crimea was occupied largely uh, without, without uh, uh, violence. And what interests me greatly, because I'm interested in ideas, is the genealogy of the concept and his policies. And the crucial figure, of course, who has been cited by Timothy Snyder and others, uh, including Robert Horvath, is uh, Alexander Dugin. Now, Alexander Dugin shares a passion that I have too, and if Marek allows me to d disclose that, uh, 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 Marek, myself, and Dugin, we all love Carl Schmitt. Uh, but we love Carl Schmitt differently from the way Dugin does. We love Carl Schmitt as, as liberals, right? And we want to learn from Carl Schmitt the lessons of the fam failure of Weimar Republic, for example, right? While Dugin reclaims Carl Schmitt in a pretty old-fashioned, though highly intelligent, fascist way. I mean, the myth of uh, his book, The Fourth Political Theory, that is really sophisticated, erudite, <coughs> but pretty fascist, right? And uh, what Dugin has in mind seems to be vindicated by Putin's policies, right? Dugin envisages a Europe ruled by two major powers, Russia and Germany. They both are directed toward, uh, against uh, uh, the United States, right? And uh, for small nations, squeezed between them, tough luck. So you can imagine that the author of Bloodlands, Timothy Snyder, is not that enthusiastic about this uh, prospect. But I spoke also to some, well, other colleagues, including Russians, who cautioned that Dugin might not be as influential as the Western press uh, uh, presents him. My worry would be that the more radical voices, even within Russian administration, are going to gain more influence as the situation is radicalizing further. People like Dugin uh, predicted like 10, 20 years ago that Crimea would be Russian, and now it is uh, Russian. And Dugin, of course, is not the only uh, prominent 
Euro-Asianist uh, uh, figure advocating uh, this uh, imperialist project. And though he is uh, decisively anti-modern, he is a very avid blogger. Uh, there uh, uh, he, he writes about Ukraine as a failed uh, nation, failed people. Uh, but I'll, I'll just go quickly to Carl Schmitt and uh, his counterpart, Jürgen Habermas. You see, if Andy wasn't here, I would have attacked Jürgen Habermas, but it's much better if I have a liberal internationalist sitting next to me. Because to me, the problem with Europe is that the weakness of Europe, the emphasis of soft on soft power Europe, resulted in Russia's strength. And Europe disempowered itself by German elites not allowing themselves to think of in terms of geopolitics, as you just mentioned in the opening remarks. So my proposition is to reclaim geopolitics. In my proposition is to reclaim Schmidt's values, but for a project that is decisively more liberal than what Dugin advocates. So I think we are deluded if we think that we still live in this kind of post-national post-political universe ruled by the communicative reason, where Rechtsstaat stands above politics, where we have normality. We have crisis, we have situation where politics is well above law, and we need to then take Schmidt's lessons seriously. So I don't know how seriously Dugin is taken in the Kremlin, but I read enough, uh, I read enough of his work to see that he is a serious thinker, as I said. He learned important lessons from Carl Schmidt. What I propose is, that we do likewise. We too, need, we too need to take Schmidt seriously. We need to think with Schmidt against Schmidt. So rejecting his substance, but taking seriously the problems he articulated about the failures of liberal democracies. What I advocate is a more muscular liberalism that can stand up to Putin's Russia. Walking through the leafy hills of Fiesole, one can be tempted by the ideals of global cosmopolitan democracy in which all conflicts might be solved by communicative rationality. Here even nature seems rational, you know, <laughs> particularly about, about around Robert Schuman Center. Yeah, we're not always sure about <laughs> that. <laughs> the EU is meant to have embodied these ideas, but we do not live in such a world. That's why we too need to think of our values and interests in a more traditional way. In response to Russia's geopolitical ambitions, we need our own geopolitics. And I am not alone advocating it. The latest issue of foreign affairs makes a similar point. We must not be ashamed to think about power and even to project power soft and hard. Yet there is one fundamental difference between Putin's Euro-Asian Union and the European Union that's worth restating. While the former aims to sub subjugate other nations, the latter is meant to enable them to pursue self-government. Ukrainians want to be a part of the European Union. That surely became clear through Maidan. They don't want to be a part of Russia, not even in Eastern Ukraine is there a majority in favor of being a part of Russia. So that's the Europe Ukrainian demonstrators fought for, and that's the Europe which the Velvet Revolutionaries of 1989 aspired for, the people whom we dedicated this conference, like Bronislav Geremek, Václav Havel, Adam Michnik. Europe needs to live up to the challenge of Putinism if its project is to survive, I genuinely believe that the crisis is very serious. As Timothy Snyder recently argued, Ukraine has no future without Europe, but Europe has also no future without Ukraine. Thanks for your attention.